What's up, y'all? My name is Corey, and this is The Overlook. And we go over the books you may have overlooked. Today, we are starting with book three, The Crown of Shadows. We also have a mini-series going on right now where we're making minute-long videos on every key we've seen so far in the story. It's all from the perspective of the creator of the keys himself. So, it should be interesting. Either way, let's get to it. I hope you all enjoy. It's late night, or better yet, early morning in Key House, and Tyler Locke is fast asleep. His bedroom door is wide open and a shadow of someone familiar is cast against the wall. Tyler groans, attempting to force himself back to sleep. It's my head. Stay out. Private. He falls back asleep, but is soon woken up once again by the sloshing of liquid in a bottle and the force of his mother plopping on his bed. Mom? Hey, what's up? It's late. Nina, his mother, hunches over and looks at the wine bottle in her right hand and her empty wine glass in her left. She takes a drink from the bottle. I've got a whole head full of awful tonight, Tyler. I'm going to have to go to Provincetown this week, and I can't take Bodie. Can't. He needs things to not be awful for a while. Tyler sits up in his bed. What's going on in Provincetown? Everything all right with Duncan, isn't it? Nina sighs. Yeah, Duncan. Yeah, all right. But Brian, Brian got hit by a car last night. Wh wh what is he? He's not dead, but he won't. I guess he isn't waking up. There's been brain swelling and they don't know. They just don't know. Tyler watches as his mother pours herself another glass. Small drops of wine splatter as they miss the cup and hit his bedsheets. Then he remembers. Oh God, Brian just left me a message the other day about maybe doing some fishing this fall and I never called him back. Why didn't I call him back? Mom, if you have to go for a day or an overnight or whatever, I'll take care of things here. I won't let anything bad happen. Nina chugs her drink to completion and attempts to stifle the tears building in her eyes. You better not. I need you three to be okay. If any of you got hurt after everything that's happened in the last few months, I would just rather be dead myself than live like that. Don't ever have children, Tyler, unless you're ready to be afraid every day for the rest of your life. I have these dreams where Sam Lesser lets me out of the wine cellar and you're all dead. He says he's sorry, but he had to kill you all and I can't wake up and I can't breathe, and you're all lined up on the floor, and I've got a scream in me, and it won't come out. Tyler places his arm around his mother's shoulder and helps her to her feet. Hey, let's get you to bed. You know, if something happened to one of you, I couldn't live through that, Tyler. I, I just couldn't. Did I wake you up? I thought you were awake. Don't worry about it. It's all right. 
but you should really try to grab some Z's. I thought you were awake. I thought I heard you in the hall. Nah, Tyler tells her. Not me. Must have been one of the ghosts. Don't joke. Sometimes I swear the shadows in this place move on their own. And downstairs, Lucas Caravaggio, or more presently known as Zach Wells, creeps his way into the room just to the right of the staircase. He closes the door behind him and then turns back to the far side of the room where the black door stands. It's a long, elegant, wooden door with an extravagant carving of a hooded figure with the wings of an angel sitting at the precipice. Two dual hooded caretakers cradling children face each other just below the winged deity. Under them, two skeletons face each other as well. But they are knelt over in prayer. Zack smirks before digging under his shirt for the small pouch he carries all of his keys in. There is the Anywhere key, the Gender key, the Echo key, and the All Black Ghost key. Zack grabs the Ghost key into the other hand, places the others back in the pouch around his neck, and enters the key into the door. The door swings inward, and Zack steps out of the threshold. As expected, his body atrophies in an instant, and he collapses to the ground. And, seconds later, he rises again. A specter who leaves his mortal shell behind, but keeps with him something unnatural and unworldly. Zack lifts into the air and coasts to the creek behind the house where another specter awaits him. Sam Lesser. I expected you sooner, Sam tells him. If I didn't know any better, I'd think you forgot about me. Zack floats down. I wanted to come see you, but I couldn't risk it. Had to wait for things to quiet down. Zack notices Sam's indifference towards him and transforms into his female self. Ah, someone has their crabby face on. Come on, Sam. Say hello to your best girl. Fuck you! Yeah, sorry on that. I'm not sure ghosts can fuck. I mean, souls don't even have a gender. They don't have creatures stuck to them either. What is that thing? That thing that's on your fucking back? The strange creature attached to Zack's spine squirms around as if it's aware it's being acknowledged. This? Zack asks. Believe it or not, Sam, it's another kind of key. It's the key to unlocking perfect happiness. Once upon a time, I was such an unhappy person, but I'm all better now. I'm never sad or lonely. Not anymore. It's not the only one either. There are more keys just like it. I want you to have one, Sam. What about what I want? What's that? I want your body. Can't help you with that, Sam. 
I'm afraid I'm fairly attached to my body. Sam's eyes drift towards the doorway. Not at the moment. Zach explains that he can get Sam a body. If that's what he wants, it wouldn't be that hard. But they can't get ahead of themselves. First, Zach starts. Have you found the key to the black door? Do you know where it is? A grin spreads on Sam's face. Why don't you use the anywhere key to go straight for it? I can't. The anywhere key doesn't work like that. You have to know where you're going. Ghosts, on the other hand, are perfectly joined to the place they haunt. If it were here in Key House, you'd know where it is by just thinking about it. So, is it here? Oh yeah. Yeah, it's here. Where? Zack asks, intrigued. Go find it yourself. You're a ghost now. It'll be easy. Sam grunts. Zack, now growing impatient, asks, What is this, Sam? This is me telling you no. Do your own errands. All right. Zack shrugs. If that's the way you want to. He looks back at the body lying in the doorway. Uh, oh no. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Me to go and leave my body unprotected? Sam, don't do this. I can bring you Bodhi's body if you want. He's young, healthy. I can do it tonight. We shouldn't be on different sides. I don't want to be some little seven-year-old snot. I want you. You're 18 and cool. And the little lock girl wants you. I'd like to feel that. I'd like to be wanted by someone for once in my life. She's beautiful, kind. I would like to be touched by someone like that someday. That's not going to happen, Zack says flatly. Why not? You used me, now it's my turn. Oh, Sam, I used you? That's very unfair. I was your friend when no one was your friend. Don't you know why you were able to hear my voice, Sam? From 2,000 miles away, I was nothing, an echo of myself, trapped in the well house. But I could extend my consciousness into other places that echo, empty places, closets and caves, sinks and systems, anything big and hollow, canyons and drainage pipes, basements and attics. And you, Sam, your soul was one enormous empty space. You were a cup with nothing in it until I came along to fill you up. You were just what I needed. I could speak to you anywhere, anytime. Sam grits his teeth. I needed help. And I gave it to you. You took what you wanted from me and then threw me away. Literally left me for dead. Now you're here because you think you can get some more from me. And people thought I was delusional. I'm here because I'm your friend. I'm the only one you have. Believe me, Sam, I don't need you. If you won't help me, 
There are other ways to find the key to the black door. You sure we can't make a deal? I just want you to be happy, Sam. What would make you happy? Sam's rage begins to boil over. His right hand then transforms into something mechanical. A chainsaw. And he revs up the engine. What would make me happy is to have never lived at all. To be wiped from the world. To be destroyed completely. And to take you with me. My hand on your throat all the way to oblivion. You destroyed me. Nothing would make me happier than returning the favor. Zack squints his eyes and prepares for Sam to attack. He transforms the end of his right hand into a fencing sword. Sam roars out as he swipes down with the chainsaw. But the attack is more than predictable for the experienced swordsman to both dodge and counterattack, slicing Sam across the nose, barely an inch under his eyes. Even a soul can be destroyed, Sam. Yours wouldn't be the first I tore to shreds. Zack slices Sam across the ribs and then upwards, vertically across the face. Weren't you ugly enough when you were alive? Do we really have to keep this up until your soul matches? Sam transforms his hand from the chainsaw to a hammer to a claw, all in an attempt to land at least one strike. It's almost entertaining for Zack. Quit, Sam. What are you hoping to accomplish? Keep it up and there won't be anything left. Zack lunges forward with his rapier and, somehow, Sam dodges it. Moving so fast, it's like he disappeared in mid-air. Zack raises his eyebrow, wondering what just happened. Then, he realizes Sam was just distracting him. No, no! Zack calls out before zipping back down to the door. Both Sam and Zack reach the threshold at the same time, and both end up inhabiting Zack's body. Give it! Mine! Sam says aloud. How deep does this go? Zack wonders. Mr. Locke seems like a good guy, Sam comments. I would never hurt you, Ellie. Zack responds. I'm just glad you guys trusted me enough to tell me about the keys, Zack laughs. I killed them because you asked me to. Sam smiles. Zack is no longer in control of the right side of his body. Sam uses Zack's right hand to grab onto the string around his neck that he uses for the keys and rings it, strangling Zack. Stop, Sam, this is un dignified. Death usually is. Mine wasn't that sexy either. Sam, let me breathe. You'll kill us both. No, just you. You forget. I'm already dead. Sam pulls back on the string and it tears the skin around Zack's neck. Do you really think you can beat me? Zack asks. You 
ugly little fuck in my own body. Sam uses Zack's right hand to slam the left side of his head against the wall, cracking it, and the force of the attack travels up the wall into the room of Nina Locke, stirring her awake from her restless struggle once again. It hurts, Zack complains. It feels so good, Sam hisses. It takes every bit of willpower Zack has to force the hand Sam is controlling closer to him so that he can get enough slack to bite apart the string. He successfully shreds it apart and attempts to scramble back towards the door. Sam trips him up and claws at Zack's face in a desperate effort. But Zack is able to gain the upper hand and force them both back through the threshold. The two specters are released back into the air and continue in their strife. Sam's left hand transforms into a noose and Zack responds by creating a giant pair of scissors that easily slices off the boy's arm. Zack lowers himself to the ground. Sam clutches his newly severed arm and begins to laugh. Do you know what you are, Sam? You're What's funny? I know exactly what I am. Sam spits. Always have. Crazy Sam. Bad Sam. Ugly Sam. I am Sam. Sam I am. Which is more than I can say for you. You don't know what you are. You think you're a boy named Zach Wells. Or maybe you think Dodge is your real name. I don't know. You think you're someone who matters. But you aren't anything. That thing in your back makes your choices for you. You feel what it wants you to feel. You know what it wants you to know. That's right, isn't it? I saw it while our souls were tangled up together inside your body. I saw it all. I was angry about the way you used me, but what you did to me is nothing compared to what that's doing to you. And I used to think I was pitiful. Sam floats over and grabs his arm off the ground. Zack heads back towards the house. He tells Sam, I know what I am, Sam. I'm gone, that's what. See you around, Sam huffs, even if you don't see me. Something else, Dodge. You'll take the key to the black door over my dead body. Sam's specter drifts away and Zack is left alone on the ground, panting and sweating profusely. Hello? The sound of Nina Locke walking down the staircase puts Zack back on high alert. He pushes himself up to his feet and attempts to snatch up the keys. The sound of the doorknob fumbling forces him to act even faster. Is someone in there? Kinsey? Bodie? Zack sprints to the door and forces in the Anywhere key, swings it open, and walks through at the exact moment that Nina enters the room. Nina grabs a knife to defend herself and points it at the empty air. Zack pants uncontrollably with his back 
against the door. Sweat pours down the side of his face. Without looking, he already knows that the situation is bad. Then, he opens up his hand and examines the contents. He still has the ghost key he was just using, the gender key, and, obviously, the anywhere key. Zack clutches onto the keys. His fist trembles as his anger builds. One of them is missing. Meanwhile, Nina examines the far corner of the room. She hasn't been in there since that night Sam Lesser died while trying to escape. The strange thing is, she swears she heard something a second ago. That's when she notices a small shimmer coming from something on the ground. Something sitting barely a foot away from the back door. Something she really wishes she didn't just find. The dreams and ideas of free men are as an army of shadows and as impossible to strike down. Colonel Adam Craze, 1736 through 1760. There is a statue of the great Colonel erected in his honor at the Lovecraft Academy campus. That's where Jordan Tyler Locke's classmate likes to hang out alone. And, as she puts it, everything is fucked. Completely fucked. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it, Tyler says, attempting to play it cool. Can I sit with you? Yeah, Jordan sighs. Finish your paper for ethics? No, downloaded a paper on the topic, but I'm not going to turn it in. I think if you cheat in an ethics class, then there's really no hope for you. Jordan pushes back her hair. I'm so full of shit. I'd cheat in a second, but I got caught downloading a paper at my last school. Of course, if I didn't pass ethics, I'll probably be out on my ass anyway. You look better with the top of your head on. She comments quietly. Tyler apologizes for what happened the previous Friday. If he knew that Jordan was going to spaz out like that, he wouldn't have played her so hard. Besides, chicks usually love the disappearing head trick. Tyler smirks. Jordan squints her eyes. It's a trick. You're saying it's a trick. What else? It didn't seem like a trick. Well, maybe it wasn't then. Maybe I'm playing you now. Wanna see another trick? Wanna see some serious Houdini shit? Abracadabra. Instant ethics paper. All you have to do is delete where it says, Buy Tyler Locke, and put your name. No way, Tyler, come on. I'll just say I couldn't do it. No one expects me to get anything done anyway. Jordan's mouth hangs open. Ty, this makes no sense. It makes sense. You just said you can't afford to fail, whereas I've got a free pass all semester long. I think... Helping you out when you're stuck is kind of ethical. Tyler holds up a flash drive and his smirk never fades. Jordan responds by kissing Tyler on the cheek, snatching the flash drive and running away, leaving him to enjoy the small victory and the rest of his morning. 
across campus, Kinsey is hanging out, people watching by an old tree, appreciating her day and appreciating her company. I could sit here with you all day, she says to Zach. Not much chance of that. I've got a class, first period. Zach responds coolly as he watches Tyler walk to his class in the opposite direction. There's a plan. Maybe you aren't scared of anything, but I am. Starting with your hulkling brother, who is also my friend. I'm not sure how matching tattoos would go over with him. Speaking of Ty, there he is. That's my cue to roll. I should catch up to him. Zach then kisses Kinsey on the forehead before racing off to class, freeing her up to be visited by another individual. So, does he fancy you, or is it more of a just friends type arrangement? Or something in between? Friends with benefits, perhaps? Maybe I fancy him, Kinsey responds snarkily. The boy pokes his head out from around the tree and tells Kinsey, I don't see it myself, not based on what I know about you. The boy introduces himself as Scott Cavanaugh. Kinsey stuck her head out a window and nearly threw up on him a few weeks ago. But other than that, they've had little contact. At the time, Kinsey was dressing like the girls on the spirit club and wore her hair like some Christian in a prayer group. You don't really fancy that dark-haired boy, do you? Scott asks. I do. He's cool. Nothing but. That's his problem. I like his alternative but not too alternative lip ring. That way, he can be edgy but still sneer at anyone who's really different. Kinsey stands to her feet and throws her back over her shoulder. He doesn't sneer at people. He's a nice guy. You don't know one thing about him or about me. Oh no, Scott chuckles. There is one thing I know about you. I know your father's name was Rendell Locke. So what? And it happens his name is written on the wall in the drowning cave, along with some other stuff. Ever been there? What's this cave? Kinsey asks, genuinely curious. Kids from this school have been going there for years to drink and make out, but no one has gone deeper into them than me, not counting the kids who died. What kids? I'm not too clear on that, really. Some unlucky blokes in the 70s or something went down there to get stoned and drowned when the tide came in. You see, the lower levels are flooded out, and the water is known to suddenly rise at high tide. Show me, Kinsey demands. Love to, this afternoon, after last bell. Oh, and I want something in return for leading you to the place where your father put his mark. I want to ask you three questions, which you have to answer truthfully. Why? I figured I was more likely to get that than a makeout session. Kinsey smiles, pushes her hair back, and stands back to her feet. I'm not afraid of the dark, and I'm not scared of kissing, and I'm sure as hell not scared of the truth. I'll see you back here after the last bell. Later, after the last bell, Scott escorts Kinsey to the drowning caves. The bone-chilling waves crash against the slippery, jagged rocks near the entrance of the cave, making it difficult to walk. Pretty down here, isn't it? 
Kinsey asks a begrudging Jackie, whom she dragged along. Beautiful, Jackie grunts. Try to burn it into your memory. Might be the last time we ever see daylight. Did you tell anyone where we're going? I didn't want to give anyone the chance to tell me no, Kinsey responds. My mom thinks I'm studying at Ear House. The only thing that worries me is that these two might think it's a date. Kinsey motions over to Scott and the friend he brought as well. A boy wearing a red jacket and an orange hat. Oh now, don't act like the idea is so terrible, Scott comments. When you come down to it, what could be more romantic than a few hours of scrambling around in a cold, dripping hole known for occasionally flooding and drowning people? Scott's friend watches as both the girls cringe, and he turns to Scott and gives him a thumbs up. Way to sell it, bro. The kids enter the cave and descend the stairway into the darkness. Scott's friend with the red jacket leads the way as he holds up a small flashlight to help him navigate. At the base of the staircase, they pass a sign littered with graffiti that reads, East Battery 13, Lovecraft Station, U.S. Government Personnel Only. Caution, stairs may be wet. East Battery, Kinsey reads out. What is this place? It was a naval observation point in World War II, the boy in the jacket responds. They had guys stationed in here with artillery, the big six inch guns, looking for U-boats and bombers and stuff. The GIs ever see anything? Nah, the only people to ever get bombed down in these caves snuck in here after Prawl. The kids navigate through an empty corridor and find a large door with a number one embedded in the center of it. Kinsey, naturally, attempts to push the door open. Ugh. Do any of these doors open? She asks, frustrated. They got most of them sealed off pretty good. They don't want anyone else ever getting trapped down here. What do you think is in there? Barracks, probably. But it's better not knowing, because then you can daydream. Who knows what they did down here in the war? What do you wish was in there? Scott asks, interjecting himself into the conversation. Sunlight, Jackie says flatly. Brains in glass jars, like all geniuses, chimes in the boy in red. An experimental time travel machine, giggles Kinsey. What about you, Scott? God! I was thinking a room stocked with kegs of aged beer. You lot all daydream much bigger than I do. The kids reach the end of the corridor and are met with a rickety fence blocking their way. Kinsey and Scott quickly examine it and discover they are able to pull up the bottom just enough for each of them to shuffle in. They then pass a wall with a large number three painted on the side and enter a flooded stairwell. Scott gasps at the sight of it. The Christing water! What are you saying? Kinsey asks. There didn't used to be water here? Not so much, the boy in red responds. It was lower. Must change with the tides. Last time we came here, it had to be six feet lower, at least. Kinsey crosses her arms. I knew this was bullshit. The hell it is, Scott yells. His name was written on the wall, maybe 12 steps down. It must be just below the water. 12 steps down? Are you sure? Kinsey 
kneels over and begins untying her shoes. Are any of those flashlights waterproof? What are you doing? Jackie snaps. I want to see if it's there. I'll be in and out. 30 seconds. Kavanaugh, give me one of those glow sticks. Kinsey dips a toe into the water and shivers are sent through her spine. That's cold. That's very cold. Jackie blocks off her path. That's right, it's cold, like as in hypothermia. And you don't know if there's currents. Jackie grabs Kinsey by the arm and she just shakes herself free. It'll be all right. I'm not afraid. I'm not questioning your bravery. I'm questioning your intelligence. Yeah, but there's something I need to see on the other side of stupid. Stay here. I'm going to want my jacket when I get out. Jackie rolls her eyes. Oh, can I stay here? Thanks. I think I will. Scott sees this and prepares for his own subnautical descent by removing his pants, revealing his pair of tidy whities Jackie cringes. Scott's friend laughs. Dude, what are you doing? You're making a terrible mistake. I won't die from a little cold, Scott remarks. I'm not talking about your life. I'm talking about your tragic choice of underwear and your decision to let two totally likable girls see them. Hold the fort, Jamal. If I don't come back, tell my mother I love her. Scott cracks a glow stick and jumps into the water. He shivers a bit, which makes Kinsey laugh. When I said get down here, I didn't mean you had to come in the water. I was seized by the sudden fantasy of myself as Leonardo DiCaprio. Besides, it isn't so bad. Like Brighton Beach in July. I think we're close to where it's written. Okay, I'm gonna go look. Kinsey takes a breath, dives underwater, and scans the area for any kind of writings, drawings, or carvings. It doesn't take her long to find her father's name, Randall Locke, and along with it, a number of other things. Another name, something Voss, was under her dad's, and above them, the phrase, the Keepers of the Keys. Kinsey holds out as long as she can, but eventually, she runs out of breath. As she crashes back to the surface, Scott asks, Did you? Saw it. But it's down. Way down. I couldn't read much. I need to go, go again. Try and get d deeper. Back. From the safety of the stairs, Jackie calls out that Kinsey has had her fun. She saw the writing on the wall. Now, it's time to come back. Jamal tells her, It's all cool. They'll be out in a sec. Let's not panic until we have something to. At that moment, a rat falls from a vent above them directly onto Jamal's shoulder. He screams out in disgust and jumps to his feet, flinging his arm around in an attempt to remove it. Fucking rat, everyone run! Jamal's sporadic behavior is too much for the old rusted screws holding the flight of stairs to take, and it forces them to crack and break apart from the wall. Jamal and Jackie, along with the stairs, then crash into the unforgiving water below. All of the children tread water in order to keep themselves afloat. 
they will have to try and find a place to climb out. But the walls of the surrounding area all look pretty smooth. Kinsey wonders aloud if this is how the other kids from the past got stuck down here. Scott shrugs, telling Kinsey it really doesn't matter at this point. Jackie continues to vent her frustration. She splashes around, making as much noise as possible until Scott tells her to stop. That's n n n n not helping. C can't hurt, Kinsey says, defending Jackie. It's a good idea. We need g g good ideas. We need to th think this through. This only angers Jackie more. Thank you for your encouragement, but the time to think this through was when we were up where it was dry. We never should have gone past the no trespassing sign in the first place. And you had no business g getting into the water. Hell, I'm supposed to be studying this afternoon. I don't belong here. So, why did you come? Because I thought you needed a friend. And I was worried you'd get into trouble down here. And guess what? You did. And you dragged me with you. As the others bicker. Jamal points out a number of railings holding up the walkway. They hang just low enough for the children to be able to lift someone up and grab them. The group chooses Jackie first, assuming she is the lightest. As Jamal and Scott hoist up Jackie, she flails and pushes down on Scott's head in order to gain some kind of balance. Oh, sorry, Scott, she says once she realizes. D d d don't mind, m mind me while I d d d drown. Jamal pulls Scott towards the other railing to help him up as well, saying, Dude, you're shivering harder than anyone. You g g get up and get Get warm. Kinsey swims up to help lift Scott, and Jackie holds out an arm to help as well. Then, when the two are sure Scott is safe, Kinsey and Jamal both look at each other and nod. There is a silent understanding between the two of them. Kinsey asks Jamal, Want a quick, quick, quick swim around? See if there's another p p place to climb out? Sure. You really think there's another place we can... No. Kinsey responds flatly. Me n neither. So why are we swimming around? Shouldn't we c conserve our energy? I w w wanted to, to get away from them so we could could talk for a m minute. They might be rescued, but this water, it's so cold. I d don't think there's much of a ch chance. I know, I already figured that out. I could guess if someone has to be in the water, it ought to b be me. If I didn't f f freak out and jump on the stairs like that, I got scared scared and put all of us in d d danger i don't don't believe it S steps probably would have fallen when we t tried to climb out i'm the one who f f f fucked up i wasn't scared enough maybe never should have gone out on the steps in the first p place. Never should have gone past that chain link fence. I p put everyone at risk. You wanted to know about your d dad. Who doesn't understand that? A small smile cracks 
the corner of Kinsey's mouth. Thanks. Still, I c can't have Jackie die because of me. Both Kinsey and Jamal finish the lap around the perimeter, and Jackie is the first to ask them if they found anything. Unfortunately, the answer is no, which leaves the children with no other choice but to wait and see if anyone comes. Come on, Jamal, grab my hand so you don't have to paddle around tiring yourself out. Jackie grips onto the railing and reaches down with her free arm. Jamal grabs it, but the combined weight proves to be too much for the rusted structure. L -l let go, Jamal calls out. No good. If I don't pull the strut down, I'll yank your arms out of their s s sockets. Leave it. Jamal backpedals back to where Kinsey is before turning back to Jackie. Hey, my older brother, his name is Treat. Do me a favor, if I freeze to death, stop right there, Jackie snaps. That's not happening. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Just tell Treat all my porn is on a file on my hard drive marked social studies. I don't want my mom, you know. Kinsey lifts up her glow stick she's holding and points it at Scott. Better ask me those questions, Kavanaugh, before I'm too cold to answer them. Kinsey, I, I don't think. They, they were just stupid. Under the circumstances, I'd rather... F fuck him. Jamal interrupts. I'll take his questions, if he doesn't want them. What's the best thing you remember about your d dad? Him reading to me, Kinsey answers. When I was little, we had a b blanket, a special reading blanket. It smelled like him, like fall, autumn, f f football, whatever, like things ending. My d dad and I built a barn. For his brother, it was like the best summer ever. I built that barn in my sleep sometimes. Me and him and my older brother. Is your dad? Jamal lowers his head. He got it in Afghanistan. I'm so, so sorry. Hey, feelings mutual. Hmm. Next? Kinsey smiles. Well, first of all, I like you and everything. I mean, I don't like you like you, but you know, Scott is the one with the c crush and I in no way, shape or form w want to step on his t toes. Right, bros b before hoes, got it. G get to the p point before I drown, please. I'm going to be 17 in four months, and most guys my age have c girlfriends. But do you think for 10 seconds we could both pretend? And you could, you know. 10 seconds proves to be a little too long, and Scott has no choice but to break the silence. I saw that, mate. We'll have words about this one later. Yeah, later, Jamal says softly. He turns back to Kinsey. Was it? Nice one. Total movie star kiss. Hey, I just n noticed your voice isn't sh shaking so hard. Yours neither. You think that's a good thing? Probably not. Maybe you better get to that last question. Are you scared to die? No, not really. Why? Kinsey's eyes begin to lower. That's four questions 
Sorry, Jamal. Stay up, Kinsey. Stay up. Jackie watches all of this and turns to Scott. We can't just sit here and watch them drown. I saw a show where someone made a life preserver out of a pair of jeans. You're wearing skivvies and I'm in shorts. We need to get them up and out of the water. Up here, somehow. Are you daft, woman? There's no room, and these struts can barely hold our weight. We'd pull them down, and the catwalk, too. Kinsey, here's this, and it gives her an idea. Pull them down. Jamal nods, and helps lift Kinsey out of the water so she can grab onto Jackie's railing. What are you? Jackie screams. Pull it down. No, it's the only thing. Don't be afraid. Kinsey smiles as the metal from the railway cracks and breaks apart from the wall. It might have been the screeching of the metal, but Jackie swears she even heard Kinsey laugh. What are you doing, you psycho? The catwalk crashes down into the water and creates a ladder for the children to escape. Kinsey is the last one up. Are you all right? Jackie asks, tears now forming in her eyes. Just cold. I'll live. No, I mean mentally. Do you have a death wish, Kinsey? Is there something wrong with you? Because if there is, I hope you get treatment. And I also hope you stay the fuck away from me until you get it. Coming down here was crazy and, and dangerous. And you had no business dragging you into it. Kinsey finishes her statement. No, you're right. I agree. I'm just glad you're okay. If you don't want to be my friend anymore, I understand. I can't blame you. Will you stop that? Tears are now pouring down the sides of Jackie's face. What? Being so fucking reasonable. I'm mad at you. Can't you see I'm mad at you? I was scared, Kinsey. I know. I'm sorry. I'd rather be drowned than think I got someone killed. Especially three friends. Jackie continues to sob uncontrollably and steps towards Kinsey, lowering her head into Kinsey's shoulder. Kinsey doesn't say anything. She just silently gives her a hug. And then Jamal joins in and Scott does too, but not before throwing his glow stick down into the depths. And, naturally, the glow stick sinks, quietly, through the blackness. It sinks, dimly, illuminating the surrounding area. It sinks, as it passes each of the names etched onto the wall. Rendell Locke, Aaron Voss, Kim Topher, Ellie Whedon, Mark Cho, Luke Dodge Caravaggio, Friends Forever, and the number 1988. It sinks and passes a school of fish and lets out a small thump as it hits the ground only inches away from a bony and decrepit hand of someone who must have drowned there all those years ago. Within Key House, the tapping of tiny footsteps shifts 
from the stone floor to a wooden panel before coming to an immediate halt. I'll kill you! A voice booms from down the hall. Then, nothing. Nothing but stifled panting. Stop running! You're only making it worse on yourself. Two shadows, like claws, crawl out of the doorway. I'm not giving you your hat until I get the head key back. The boy scrambles from his cover and tries to hide underneath a rug in the hallway. Keep it up. I'll open your head the old-fashioned way, via skull fracture. Tyler Locke emerges from the doorway. I don't even got the friggin' thing. Kinsey has it. Why can't you piss her off? I don't know how barks back the voice from beneath the rug. She's always calm. She's like a pod person. I can't stand it. Yeah, she's making me nuts too. Look, come out of there, kid, and I promise you won't be hurt beyond what you got coming to you. Tyler snatches up the rug. Nowhere left to go, is there, you little turd? However, to both Tyler and Bodhi's surprise, they find there is an interesting shape carved into the floorboards, one larger than any they have ever seen before. Do you think it does anything? Bodhi asks. Do you think we could take it out of the floor? What? No way, kid. I mean, even if you could pry it up, it's not like there's a lock somewhere that's... Tyler is caught off guard as he looks up and sees the window that has been sitting next to the TV all along. He also now realizes that the window is, in fact, the shape of a keyhole and it bears a remarkably similar engraving to the one at the head of the key hidden in the floorboard. Uh, no, I mean, just, no, no way. He stands to his feet and forces Bodhi out of the room. Jesus, kid, you gotta stop finding, like, keys and stuff. I don't find them. They find me, Bodhi responds. Outside, Detective Mutuku examines the steps near the black door at the back of the property, the place where Sam Lesser died. It wasn't murder, Nina says as she slowly approaches using the assistance of her cane. Of course it wasn't. Even if your son had broken Sam Lesser's neck, he didn't. It would be an obvious case of self-defense. But it wasn't self-defense because Sam broke his neck falling down these stairs trying to get away. I didn't come here to collect evidence for a case against your son, the detective says. You called me, remember? I apologize if it looks like I'm snooping. You didn't answer the door. I thought you might be in the backyard. After what you and your family have been through, I'd be surprised if you weren't on edge. Especially after the incident in Cape Cod Friday night. Nina escorts the detective into the kitchen and grabs her half-finished drink from on top of the counter. Interest you in a Bloody Mary? She smirks. Hmm? Ah, no. I don't drink while I'm theoretically at work. I wouldn't turn down a cup of coffee, however. See? That's perfect. I made a pot out of habit this morning, but I couldn't drink any. I can't handle the caffeine like I used to, apparently. Makes me jumpy. 
I'm already too jumpy as it is. I kept waking up the other night, thinking there was someone breaking into the house. I can at least ease your mind on one manner. What happened to Brian Rogan was tragic and a crime, but is not connected in any way to what Sam Lesser did to your family. The woman who ran him down was drunk and had already exchanged ugly words with Mr. Rogan in a bar earlier that night. It isn't my area, but I understand tensions have been high on the Cape in the wake of the recent gay marriage rulings. All right. After what Duncan told me, I didn't think there was any chance, but he's very distraught. I figured I'd better get a second opinion. I understand. I'm glad to be your sounding board, Mrs. Locke. Are you? Is there something more? Nina walks over to a nearby drawer and pulls out a plastic Ziploc bag with a key inside. She tells Detective Mutuku she remembers Sam was fixated on keys and she found this one in the same parlor Sam died in and it matches the same description of the key Sam was looking for. The detective examines the key. How curious. Sam Lesser had homemade tattoos showing keys of different sorts. I wonder if this matches any of them. I could compare to the photo record. Not that it matters, but it's interesting. Thanks for listening to my crazy talk. This is Locke. Last year, a deranged man assaulted me with a death ray made out of a toilet plunger and tinfoil. I grew up in a nation where children carry machine guns. My mother enrolled me in fencing classes after she had a dream that someday I would need to defend myself with a sword. I wouldn't know crazy if it bit me in the face. After their conversation ends, Nina escorts Detective Mutuku to his car and prepares to drive off herself. Tyler asks what the two were speaking about, but his mother just waves it off as procedural stuff. She moves the conversation forward, stating if she is able to catch the last ferry, she should be back by 11 that night. So that means Tyler is responsible for Bodhi. No girls, no keg. Don't worry about it, Tyler huffs. I'll probably just roll a joint and doze off in front of the tube. Hardy fucking har. I come back and find this house in ruins. I won't be stringing you up by your neck, understand? Yup, got it. Tell Duncan to hang in there. Tell him we love him and tell him we're thinking about him and Brian. Before she leaves to visit Duncan in Provincetown, Mina notices that she has forgotten her cell phone. She sends Kinsey up to her room to grab it for her, but the amount of time it takes for Kinsey to retrieve it becomes concerning. Meanwhile, Kinsey, with Nina's cell phone in hand, continues to search Nina's room for something else. Finished looking through my things? Nina hisses. I was trying to find the charger for you. I've got a travel charger in the car. I think you know that. I turned a blind eye to you tiptoeing into the house the other day after you went for a swim with those boys till almost dark. I can forgive you for being a little wild, but not being a sneak. Kinsey opens a drawer, revealing a number of half-drunk bottles of alcohol. She holds one up. That's funny, Mom. I can forgive you for being suspicious and mean and angry all the time. After what you went through in Willits, you've earned it. 
Nina squints her eyes, and she warns Kinsey, You don't know anything about it. Kinsey continues, But I have a harder time forgiving you for being a shitty, irresponsible drunk. Waking Tyler up in the middle of the night to cry all over him like he isn't dealing with a few things himself. Christ, you've already been drinking. I can smell it on your breath. At least, you're only driving yourself. I can't imagine you taking Bodie in the car. At that moment, Tyler shows up. Go for a walk, Kinsey. Or what? You're gonna drag me out? It's my house too, Tyler. And you can't scare me into... I know I can't. That's why I'm asking. Please, be done here. Kinsey pouts and walks towards the exit. Nina tells her she doesn't even recognize her anymore. You got that right. You don't know. You crashed the car driving drunk. I'm not going to cry over it. I'm all cried out these days, and you know what you're doing, in theory. Christ, will you get out? Tyler asks again. And then, when the two are alone, Tyler tells his mother, Mom, she didn't mean to. She meant every word. You know, we've talked about what happened to Dad in Willits. But we, we never talked about what happened to, will you leave me alone, Tyler? I need a second. Tyler lowers his head before leaving. Nina tries to hide her tears, but it's impossible. So, right before she leaves, she takes one last drink. Later, Scott Cavanaugh and Jamal ride their bikes onto the Key House property. They find Kinsey taking a nap on one of the benches in the courtyard with a comic book covering her face from the sun. Scott tells Kinsey, Tell your mother a dastardly lie and come away with us. Don't ask questions. We're not going to tell you where we're going anyway. Just come along. Kinsey lifts the book and smirks. I can't. Not tonight. Sorry. Aren't you at least a little curious about our latest death-defying destination? No. Not really. It doesn't matter. Damn, woman. You're relentless. All right, I'll tell. We're off to Boston to see Muse at the Beacon for a night of personal transcendence through loud, arty, English prog rock. You sure you can't nip off with us? You've got a ride into Boston? Uh, not yet, Jamal says. Kinsey sits up to offer the two a seat on the bench and notices Jamal has a package he's holding in his hands. Did you check to see if it's an all-ages show? Actually, it's 21 and older, Scott admits. So you've got fake IDs? Eh, no. So, you've got no ride and no way to get in. And no money. Boy, this sounds like a hell of a night. Your sarcasm never fails to give me a delicious little thrill. Who's being sarcastic? I wish I could go with you guys. I really do. But I'm on kid duty with Ty. Sorry. Jamal hands her the package and tells Kinsey not to worry about it. And for the record, he doesn't honestly think they'll make it. It's just a nice daydream. But 20 to 1 odds says they don't even get further than the comic shop in downtown Lovecraft. The package 
on the other hand, is just a token of gratitude for saving their lives. Something practical. But hot, Scott comments. Be delighted to see you in it, love. Bit revealing, though. Bit kinky. Not the kind of thing I think you'd have the nerve to wear to school. That night, around 8.19 p.m., Tyler is reading a bedtime story for Bodhi. Tonight's pick, Peter Pan. Then, when Bodhi is fast asleep, Tyler returns back downstairs to watch a couple of music videos. Meanwhile, Kinsey is blissfully instant messaging her friend a thank you message. She had opened the present earlier that night and found that it contained a life jacket. She tells her friend it's her new comfort blanket and that she'll probably sleep with it. Jamal comments that it might even save her life one day. Who knows? Nina calls to check in with Tyler from Provincetown. She was at the hospital with Duncan the entire day until she finally convinced him to go home and get some sleep. Unfortunately, she's going to be home later than she thought. She overstayed at Duncan's and missed the last ferry by 10 minutes. So, she's going to have to drive the long way home. She's also going to have someone stop by the house to check up on the kids and to drop something off. Tyler can hear in his mother's voice how tired she is. And she is. So, she agrees to stay the night in Provincetown. And she hangs up the phone. And she takes another sip from her drink. While Tyler is distracted by his mother on the phone and the women on the television, Zach uses the Anywhere key to sneak into Key House. He enters through the kitchen and creeps through the doorway to the basement. Where did you put it, Rendell? He wonders aloud as he looks from left to right. Then, he feels on top of the wooden support beams. No, too obvious. After that, he tries to find a loose piece of flooring. No luck there, either. No loose flooring, no loose stones on the wall, and nothing under the wooden boxes stacked in the corner or the jars of preserves stacked on top of those. Where did you put it? It's here. You wouldn't have gotten rid of it. The shadows were too useful and you liked them too much. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. I need to have it. Zack continues to lift one jar after another, becoming more and more frustrated as the seconds pass. Where? Where is it? Where? Where? What? Zack grabs the last jar of preserves and holds it up into the air. His hand shakes with anger as he prepares to smash the glass on the floor. But then, he notices what it says on the label. Black Currants Jelly 1988 Black Current Zack reads aloud, noticing the misspelling. There is an E in current where there should be an A. Black Currants? Rendell, you hopeless dork. You always did like a bad pun. Zack smirks and drops the jar onto the ground, shattering it and revealing a hidden key. This one has extravagant silver and black carvings. The head of the key fashioned into a flame and the base of the key into a candle wick. 
Luckily for Zack, there is a small doorway in the basement with a lock and doorknob with a similar engraving of a flame. It helps that the keys always match their locks. Once Zack opens the small door, the key begins to glow. He crawls through the cramped space and is greeted by a stone staircase leading down into the darkness. There are numerous candles scattered throughout the area, all surrounding a lone pedestal in the center of the room. And on top of that pedestal sits an ebony crown with sharp, jagged protrusions. In the front of the crown are two creatures. One is not unlike a hippogriff, the other a dragon. Both of the beasts, guardians of their respective cloaked figures. The cloaked figures, guardians in their own right, each holding onto a ring which would sit in the center of the wearer's forehead. And within that ring, a placement for a key. Zack scoffs. The dim light from the key in his hand casts his shadow across all corners of the room, creating dark reflections, twisted with a growing glee. Then, Zack places the key in the center of the crown, and the light turns off. And, as he lifts the crown and places it on top of his head, the shadows around the room begin to protrude from the walls, growing dripping snout and gnashing teeth. They growl and wrestle from left to right, attempting to free themselves. Zack closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. Hello, darkness, my old friend. More creatures sprawl out from the shadows created by the candles. Ferocious beasts, giant insects, bats and snakes alike, vultures and demons, and the room falls silent. Wake all the shadows in the house. I need you to look everywhere. Find the key to the well house and the key to the black door. Don't worry, I'll be helping you look. But first, I probably ought to slip into something more comfortable. The shadows seep onto Zack shrouding him in blackness. I think I probably ought to be something a bit more badass. I need a look that'll throw them off. And really, they're expecting Bodhi's Dark Lady from the Well. Now, it's 9.22 and Bodhi is fast asleep. The copy of Peter Pan that Tyler was reading to him is open on the bed. And suddenly, the shadow from beneath Bodhi slides from under him and sits up in the bed. Silently, it looks over at the open page and gets the idea to transform into something a little more insidious. At 9.23, the shadow slams the book shut, waking Bodhi up. Meanwhile, Kinsey is still instant messaging her friends from earlier. She took off the life jacket a little while ago and set it on her pillow. At 9.23, Jamal tells her and Scott he's got a hot date with his right hand and signs off with their new patented farewell. The words, stay dry. All the while, 
Kenzie's shadow is stretching out from the wall. It transforms itself into something truly terrifying. A large form replica of Kinsey's tangible fear creature. With its hissing tongue, growing claws, and pointed knife. Downstairs, creatures are growing around every corner of the television room Tyler usually sits in. He isn't there. So, this gives them ample opportunity to accumulate. They giggle at one another, but no sounds escape their mouths. Soon after, Tyler returns with a freshly bought, half-open pizza box in hand. He grabs a slice out and bites down on it. The fuck? He mumbles with his mouth full when he notices the shadowy beasts. Then, a Spartan warrior grows from Tyler's own shadow and taps him on the shoulder. Tyler turns around to look and is instantly met with a backhand from the beast. Tyler responds by sending out a right hook. It makes contact, but does nothing to slow down the attacker. The other shadows then jump into the fight. They wrap him up until Tyler is fully consumed by the darkness, and they don't stop hitting him. Within the silence of night, the shadows play. Some bark, some sneer, some hiss. Some form together around the boy, encasing him in a chrysalis made of tar, and hang him upside down from the ceiling. Perhaps to turn him into one of these ebony soldiers as well. Who is to say? But they wait. The shadows wait until their leader arrives. And she grabs onto the boy's hair and pulls him closer so he can get a better look. Her claws cut into the skin of his scalp. Ugh, you her? Tyler asks. The dark girl Bodhi met in the well house. The one who sent Sam Lesser to kill my dad. The woman doesn't answer. Yeah, I was hoping I'd get a chance to say hello to you sometime. Tuh! Tyler hawks a loogie in the woman's face. How do you do? The woman's demeanor changes from her once calm indifference. You like that? Wait till you get a load of how I plan to say goodbye, bitch. Where's Kinsey and Bodhi? Would you? Hey, what are you? The woman turns on her heel, wiping the spit from her face, and allows for her beasts to nip at Tyler's flesh. Stop! Ah, fucking no! Tyler shakes from left to right in an attempt to both free himself from his bindings and distance himself from his rabid attackers. Upstairs, Kinsey is dealing with her own problems. The giant shadow of her fear incarnate whips its tongue back and forth as it uses one hand to pin Kinsey down onto the bed, covering her mouth and most of her nose. Kinsey uses her right hand to try to move the creature's arm as her left hand flails around, desperately searching for air. She knocks her laptop off the table and, with the light from her screen pointed in the opposite direction, the shadow creature somehow becomes stronger. 
the creature's claw, gripped around Kinsey's mouth, begins to transform from a solid to a gelatinous sludge, and it seeps from its wrist to Kinsey's nose, filling it and suffocating her successfully. The sludge then resolidifies within Kinsey's nostrils, forming barbed wires within it, making it impossible for Kinsey to rip them out without both causing her extreme pain and tearing her own flesh. Kinsey slashes her own claw at the creature, but it's no use. She finds the creature is only solid when it needs to be. But then, she remembers her gift from Jamal and Scott. The Life Jacket Kinsey pats behind her head for where she placed the life jacket. She didn't think of it too much at the time, but the jacket came with a flashlight strapped to the right shoulder. She finds it and searches for the button to turn it on, even through its black coat. Kinsey can see the concern growing on the fiend's face as she successfully presses down on the button and turns the light on. Once the light is off of it, the creature returns. It looks at Kinsey, and it looks at the clock on her nightstand, and it hisses. Once Kinsey gets into the hallway, she finds a slew of shadows waiting for her. Vampires and crocodiles and amalgamations of horror. Mixtures of creatures with over a dozen eyes and no legs that function. They just slither like snakes on the ground, inching their way over to the girl. However, Kinsey doesn't yell. She doesn't scream. She just turns on her flashlight and sprints down the staircase, calling out for her brothers. Tyler is still hanging upside down in the kitchen. The blood is rushing to his head, and it drips from the bite wounds he's received from the gnashing beasts. Please, he mumbles, exhausted. Please. The woman crosses her arms and places her hand under her chin. She's enjoying this. She then places a finger on Tyler's lips, silencing him, before raising her arms. From one hand, a shadow of a key emerges. From the other, another. Tyler squints, attempting to make sense of the shapes in front of him. Uh, it's a little hard. Upside down? An arm grows from the shadow around Tyler and it pulls him by the ear, yanking his head up to a 45 degree angle. Just enough for him to get the picture. Keys, keys, okay, gotcha, he yips. Then, given another second, Tyler notices the key over the woman's right hand. The Omega key. I know about that one. What's the other one? The Omega key dissolves, and the second key turns horizontal and hovers from over her right hand to her left. Then, another shadow appears. A small building with one window and a door. The well house? Tyler asks. You want a key to the well house? Why? You're already free. Unless someone with that key could make you go away. That it? And why the fuck don't you say anything? Can't you talk? You talk to Bodhi. The well house dissolves and the key to it, the echo key, hovers back to the woman's right hand. The woman 
then creates a shadow of Tyler's mother, Nina. Naturally, Nina is drinking straight from the bottle. The shadow of Nina then drops the bottle and grabs onto the key. Mom? You think my mom has it? Huh. Alright. I guess there's no point in trying to lie. You're half right. I mean, she did have it. But she gave it to me to put in a safe place. So, I stuck it up my ass. You want it back? You'll have to reach on up there and get it. The woman from the well squints her eyes and backhands Tyler. As she swings, she produces barbs on each arm that cut his skin. F fuck Motherfucker! I can't wait to climb down here and get large on you, bitch! Kinsey gets to the door just outside the kitchen and stops. Shadows from myth and legend attempt to force their way inside. Goblins and trolls and witches and even a mad king in the shape of an egg. Kinsey! Bodie calls out from the other side of the door. Open the door! Kinsey yells back as she turns on the flashlight and sprints forward. The shadows dissolve and it takes some sleight of hand for Kinsey to turn the flashlight backwards in one motion to keep the light on the beasts. Unfortunately for her, the door is barricaded. Uh, uh, Bodie! Oh, Ben! The fuck? King Door! I'm trying! I'm trying! Bodhi removes all the various objects he has stacked in front of the door just in time for Kinsey to tumble into the kitchen. Once she's safe from the shadowy fiends, she asks, Are you alright? I'm scared. Hey, who wouldn't be? You? What are they? I think they're just shadows come to life somehow. How'd you wind up in the kitchen, Bodie? One of them grabbed me and dragged me downstairs. I don't know where he was trying to take me. There were lots of other shadows too, looking through my dresser and stuff. My shadow had me all wrapped up in this stuff, but he left a hand free. So. When he was dragging me through the kitchen, I grabbed the fridge door and yanked myself free. It was weird. He just gave up. I don't think he really wanted to take me prisoner. I turned on the lights and blocked the door and I've been in here ever since. Did you try calling? They smashed the phone. Yeah, okay. You did good, Bodie. Are we going to be all right? Kinsey scoots closer to her little brother and pushes his chin up so they meet eye to eye. Are you kidding? These guys are pushovers. They're like most monsters, only scary in the dark. You turn on the lights and they melt away. That's what's keeping them out. It isn't the stuff against the door, it's the light. That's why your shadow let you go too, I bet. The light from the fridge. Damn, I should have been switching on the lights as I came this way. Stupid. It is 940 when two of the shadow fiends find the fuse box outside and cut the lights. Now, without even opening the door, the shadows outside the kitchen are able to phase their way through the solid wood and walling. Hold on, Bodie. Hold on. Kinsey holds up her flashlight and pushes her younger brother behind her. Meanwhile, Tyler, still hanging upside down in the front room, asks, Wh what's going on? 
his Spartan shadow and Bodhi's wood nymph shadow walk into the room. The nymph tugs on the silent woman's cloak. The Spartan points towards the window and they all exit the room. Outside, Detective Mutuku drives his car up the brick driveway and parks it just outside Key House. In one hand, he has the Echo Key, still in a Ziploc bag. In the other, a bottle of wine, most likely a gift for Nina. From the window, the woman from the well pushes the curtain aside and scowls at the unexpected inconvenience. No matter, she will just summon more shadows to deal with this new threat. From another window, Bodhi is watching. It's Mr. Matuku, he gasps. Help! Bodhi waves his arms in the air in order to get the detective's attention. Meanwhile, Kinsey is fighting off the fiends. She uses her flashlight sparingly, flashing it on and off only when she is certain her or her brother's life is in danger. Detective Mutuku hears Bodhi's cries for help and approaches the kitchen window. At that moment, the shadows attack. Shadowy, wolf-like beasts tackle him to the ground. Kinsey's shadow hunches over and lashes its tongue back and forth, burying its fangs. Tyler's shadow trembles its fist, threatening the detective to comply. The detective dropped both the bottle and the echo key. It clinked as it hit the ground. Kinsey's shadow chuckles silently as it picks up the key between its sharp nails and holds it up. They got him! Bodhi cries, trying to piece together what he's seen. They knocked him down! They're doing something to him! Around Kinsey's shadow's neck hangs the head key. As the Spartan lifts the detective to his feet, the fear creature inserts the key in the base of the detective's neck. Then, both the shadows escort Detective Mutuku back to his car. The detective sits back in his seat, places his key into the ignition, and turns on the vehicle. Thanks for keeping it tuned to Smooth Hits Boston. Coming up next, we're gonna spin that new one by Elvis Castillo. Kinsey's shadow reaches through the window and removes the key from the detective's neck. Goodness! Now, what did I come up here for? He asks himself. You're spending too much time thinking about beautiful widows, Daniel. It's going to get you into trouble. From within the kitchen, Bodhi watches it all unfold. Kinsey! They used the head key on him! He's going! He's driving away! God damn it! Kinsey curses. Open the window. I can't! The locks are stuck! Can you? Before Bodhi can finish his question, Kinsey picks up a pan and hurls it out of the kitchen window, shattering the glass. It clanks as it hits the brick tile, alerting her and Tyler's shadows. She then helps Bodhi out of the window before leaping out herself. Come on, she orders, grabbing her younger brother by the wrist and leading him towards the shadows. Kinsey flashes her light, forcing the shadows to disappear. The head key, now fastened to nothing, drops to the ground. 
she makes sure to pick it up as they pass. However, once they do, the shadows once again reappear. The front doors to the manor swing open and shadows flood from inside Key House to the cool embrace of the night. Where is it? asks the woman of shadows. Where is it? asks the woman from the well. Where's the well house key? The shadows answer through a mental link and silent gestures. What? Who? Kinsey? How could she take it away from you? Does she have some kind of light? Flashlight or something? The silent woman's nose flares with rage and pent up frustration. I don't care what she has. Make enough darkness and her dim little light won't mean a fucking thing. All shadows to me. She summons all of the shadows and brings them into her, absorbing all of their mass and strength with them. Even the shadows around Tyler are bound by the woman's order. It drops Tyler to the floor to answer her call. And when they all combine, when the shadows all form around the woman, they turn into something, a creature that young Bodhi cannot comprehend. I can't. Tired, he tells his sister, huffing between words. I know, buddy, but just keep running and don't look back. Tyler looks outside the window by the television and sees his younger brother and sister running from the creature formed by the accumulated shadows. It stands taller than Keyhouse itself. It stomps, heavy enough to shake the ground under their feet, but still silent nonetheless. It wears the face of a wolf and has the body of a man. It has claws sharper than glass and long, stringy hair made of serpents. It wears a crown of thorns, armor around the shoulders, and a cloak. And it has unsuccessfully bound itself by its own chains. Without a second thought, Tyler knows what to do. He scrambles back towards the kitchen and rips up the rug covering the wooden key carved into the floorboards. The carving in the head of the key, a large man with his arms stretched out, standing above and carved attached to a smaller version of itself. It's heavy. It takes Tyler longer to pick it up than expected and takes more effort to smash it through the window than he needed it to. But it works. A blinding light is produced from the window and it moves both upward towards the ceiling and down towards the floor at the same rate until it completely severs the house in two. Two massive hands force the crack open and a giant version of Tyler emerges. He stands taller than the trees, taller than Key House, maybe even taller than the shadow creature. And Tyler taps the creature on the shoulder, lifts his fist, and says, Hey, dog face! Can't say I didn't warn you. Kenzie Locke lies there, helpless, on the ground, pinned by the claws of the shadow fiend. The monster managed to steal the echo key from her and 
is attempting to steal back the head key as well. Bodhi hides behind a rock not too far away. His anxiety builds, taking full control of his body. He can do nothing more than sit and watch. His indecisiveness kills him, and he begins to hyperventilate. Then, a shadow grows over the two of them, not from the fiend, no, from their brother, Tyler. He stands stories tall and carries an even larger scowl upon his face. They cannot make out the words he says. His voice is too deep. It just booms, enough to shake the branches on the trees. Even the shadow fiend is caught by surprise, and this gives Bodhi just enough time to retrieve his sister. Tyler grabs the fiend and lifts it above his head before hurling it in the opposite direction of Key House. As the creature's body hits the ground, it continues to slide towards the edge of the cliff. Trees are ripped out by the roots. Rocks are pushed aside, and the dirt is left permanently changed. Like a meteor crashing down from above, a trail of destruction is left in the creature's wake. Tyler gives the creature no time to react. He rushes forward, fists ready in order to land a follow-up attack while it's still on the ground. The snakes in the shadow creature's hair hiss and dance back and forth, preparing to bite and entangle the overgrown teenager. Its tail, like that of a scorpion, jabs at the open air. All the while, the shadow creature uses its massive claws to scoop up the earth into a mound and uses a sand attack to cloud Tyler's field of vision. It doesn't matter. Tyler's rage is palpable, tangible. This creature, this monster, has been tormenting his family for too long. And it ends tonight. Tyler pushes through the cloud of debris and sends out a strong left jab. Just like before, the fiend, viscous, shadowy coat is able to absorb most of the blow. However, the power from the strike proves to still be great enough to bring the creature to its knees. The creature, losing ground, sends out a counterattack, an uppercut to Tyler's ribcage. Tyler grits through the pain. He tries to retake the advantage, but the creature is able to lift Tyler up and vault him over his shoulder, over the cliff, and into the bone-chilling water below. Massive waves are created under him as he crashes down. But it's not enough to stop him. Not even close. Then, the creature leaps down from on top of the cliff and lunges with a jab of its own. Its punch connects with the side of Tyler's jaw. Again, the boy refuses to yield. He meets the monster with a punch of his own, making contact and stretching the blackened tar from the creature's body. And it can't help but let out a smirk, revealing all of its sharpened, sinister teeth. Now, it knows it has the upper hand. Tyler's hand, and arm by extension, is caught within the black sludge, now making it hard for him to escape the creature's grasp. Tyler attempts to free himself, but just like if he were to sink into quicksand, his struggles only serve to make his escape 
that much more difficult. Tyler stumbles left to right across the bay, trying to throw the beast off of him. And that's when he sees it. The lighthouse. The creature, still focused on attacking Tyler, does not notice the light on top of the lighthouse slowly turning in its and Tyler's direction. And Zack is caught off guard as its shine shatters his shadowy carcass. The force of the explosion pushes Tyler into the water and sends waves crashing in every direction. Then, Zack, his crown, and the echo key all plunge into the water one after another. Tyler, still larger than life itself, scans the water beneath him for any trace of the enemy. Zack manages to scoop up the echo key in his escape, but he lost both the shadow key and the crown in his fall. He washes up on the beach, nearly drowned, and hurriedly hurls up seawater before making his retreat into the shadows. And, with no signs of life from his enemy, Tyler makes his way back to the coast as well. It doesn't take long for Kinsey to appear. She carries her younger brother Bodhi in her right arm. He clings to her tightly. Small sobs escape him as tears run down his cheeks. It's okay, kid. She tells him, I think it's over. See, there's your big bro. No pun intended. You guys all right? Tyler asks, lowering himself to as close as eye level as possible. Yeah, Kinsey responds. You? Tyler lowers his left hand and beckons for his brother and sister to come forward. Fine. Here. Climb up. I want to show you something. Kinsey helps Bodhi up first before climbing up herself. Once they do, Tyler lifts them both into the air, high enough for them to see all of Lovecraft. Wow. Kinsey gasps. Wow. Bodhi adds. He's not so much concerned with the view, but with the small white crown sitting not but a few feet away from him within his brother's palm. This is home, guys, Tyler tells the two. We're not going to run from shadows here. Not tonight. Not ever. Later, just before sunrise, Nina Locke's car screeches to a halt in the key house driveway. As she crawls out of the car, she scans the area. Something's different. She just can't tell what. Nina ascends the front steps into the manor and the door swings open for her to find her home in complete disarray. Overturned flower pots. Dirty clothes laid out on the floor. Broken picture frames and the like. No. Oh God, no. She mumbles to herself, expecting the worst. Ty? Kinsey? Bo Bodhi? Nina opens the kitchen door to find Bodhi sitting at the counter, reading his copy of Peter Pan. Hey, you're back! Bodhi says cheerfully, as if the kitchen was in any better condition than the front room. Broken dishes, pots and pans cast aside, open cabinets, her wine bottle laying on the floor, open with its contents spilled out creating quite the hazard. What the Christ happened here? Nina grits her teeth and looks around for her two older children. 
I don't know. Bodhi shrugged, quite mischievously. It was like this when I woke up. How was Duncan? The clicking from Nina's cane tapping the flooring drifts into the television room, where she finds Tyler fast asleep with an ice pack on one side of his face and the ear on the other side covered up like he was in some kind of wrestling accident. Dirty laundry is scattered everywhere. Pants are on the sofa. Socks are on the table. Even a pair of black panties are carelessly draped on one of the lamps. God, I think these are mine. Tyler, she says, waking her son. When I walked in the house, I thought I was going to find you dead. In a few minutes, you're going to wish I did. Uh, yeah, Tyler groans as he fully wakes up. Me and Kinsey kind of had some friends over and shit got a little out of hand. But I will totally clean up. And pay for the broken windows. Windows? Nina asks, stepping backwards. Plural. Kinsey is reading a comic book at the bench by the birdbath when Tyler walks up with his hands in his pockets trying to keep it casual. Nice one, hiding out here. I thought you weren't afraid of anything. It's not a question of fear. Staying out of her way this morning is just good sense. How's she? Better than I thought. She didn't say much. That's cause she's ashamed. She's... The fuck are you talking about? Kinsey keeps her eyes glued to the panels in her book. Missed the fairy? Sure she did. Tyler averts his eyes, instead choosing to stare at the clouds until the moment passes, until Kinsey chooses to break the silence. Speaking of not being afraid of things, why is it okay to open Bodhi's head and take out his memory of the living shadows, but not his sense of fear? We covered this. Maybe you think your life is perfect now that you have nothing that scares you, but Bodhi is six. Without a sense of fear, I don't think the kid would look both ways before crossing the street. He'd get himself dead in 24 hours. Whereas we had to make him forget the shadows. Little turd would never sleep again. By the way, what'd you do with the crown? I put it out of reach. That's all you or anyone else needs to know. No one is going to use it to wake up those monsters ever again. Not if I have anything to say about it. Another moment passes. She'll be back, you know. The dark lady from the well. She's going to keep coming back until she finds it. The key to the black door. Yeah, well, she's going to have to come through us to get it. I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. That makes one of us. Later, at Lovecraft Academy, all the students turn their heads and snicker amongst themselves as Kinsey Locke passes them by, unfazed by neither their glares nor their comments. Scott Kavanaugh bet her she wouldn't wear the life jacket to school. And, well, she's taking him up on that bet. Much to Zach's chagrin. Kinsey, where you going, girl? We expecting a flood? When Kinsey doesn't respond, Zach has no choice but to grab her by the arm. No, really, what's up with the life preserver? Some friends gave it to me, so I'm wearing it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Seriously, do you have any idea how lame you look? I mean, there are people laughing. 
My friends will think it's cool. I'm not really worried about anyone else's opinion. Hey, Jamal, Scott. Wait, those are the friends we're talking about. Kavanaugh and Saturday? Hey, I haven't been at Lovecraft Academy any longer than you, but even I know that hanging out with those two is jumping off the social cliff into the deep seas of uncool. That's so. Well, I guess this is where I say Geronimo. Whatever. We'll talk about this at lunch. I'll be sitting with them at lunch. So, if you want to be with me, guess you'll have to jump too. Hey guys, wait up! Across campus, it seems like Tyler is having a discourse of his own. Tyler, Tyler Locke, screeches a voice from behind him. He turns around and sees that it's Jordan, fuming with rage, with a stack of papers rolled up in her hands. What's up? Tyler says nervously. Jordan? What the fuck is this? She slams the papers into his chest. An F. A fucking F. Christ, what kind of retard are you? I didn't even do the reading, and I could have faked my way to a D. Tyler, honestly amazed, grabs the papers and examines them. She flunked it? Cornwall flunked your paper? What did she say? shows no comprehension for the core ideas. She said plot summaries are not the same as understanding. I trusted you and you fucked me, Locke. Ah! Every time I start to pity you, you turn into a fucking freak on me. Just stay the fuck away from me before you completely ruin my life. Jordan stomps away and leaves Tyler alone with the paper. He reads Miss Cornwall's notes on it one more time before drifting his attention back up to the clouds. On his way, a leaf catches his attention. He watches quietly as the wind rips it from a dying tree branch and the leaf dances in the air. And Tyler can't help but notice it starts to look pretty nice around there, when the leaves start to change. Something came in the mail today. It was from an old family friend, Linda Mare, and it came with a note. After she read it, Nina ran to fetch a bottle of Black Crest wine. The letter that came with the package stated the item it contained was left in Linda's old VCR, and it's a good thing her husband, Henry, looked. And once she saw it, Linda was sure Nina would want to have it. Nina opens the bottle and pours herself a glass before plopping on the bed in front of her TV. There is a brief amount of static, but then a familiar face pops up on the screen. Knock, knock. The sound of her husband's voice forces Nina to take a sip. You're supposed to say, who's there? A smaller voice then cries out from behind her. M mom Bodhi walks into her room with both hands clasped under his chin. Blood seeps out from between his fingers. Tears gently spill down the sides of his face. I f fell down and hurt myself. Nina 
leans over to hug her son. And that's when Bodhi notices the television. It's dad! Let's try this again. Knock, knock, Rendell says through the television. Who's there? Bodhi whispers back. Wanda! Like, Wanda see me juggle? I'm really good at it. Bodhi smiles at the television, entranced, as he watches his father pick up three dishes and suspends them in mid-air. He completely forgets about the pain from his injury. He's juggling, he tells his mother as she returns with the first aid kit. Yeah, the big ol' show off. There, all better. Nothing broke mom doesn't know how to fix. Dare I ask how you got yourself bloodied up? Bodhi leads Nina into the bathroom where she finds her old broken cane and a shattered wooden stool. What exactly were you trying to accomplish? Bodhi points to the water tank above the toilet. I saw something up there. And you were trying to get it down with this? This is my old cane, isn't it? It was already broken. I know. Nina tells Bodhi, trying to stifle that memory of her breaking it that day in Willits. Nina then steps onto the toilet, reaches up, and finds another hidden key on top of it. A key? Another goddamn? Okay, well... One more for the collection. I wonder what it does. Nina focuses on the engravings on the key. Twin serpents entangle it like a medical symbol. It also happens to resemble a symbol painted on the black medicine cabinet in the corner of the room. What it does? Nina asks her son. It opens this medicine cabinet. That's what it does doesn't make you into a ghost, doesn't open up your head. Nina grabs the pieces of her broken cane, throws them into a cabinet, and locks the door. What it does is magically give us a place to stick some broken shit. End of story. Later that night, Bodhi is attempting to replicate what he saw his father do on the home video. Besides dishes, however, Bodhi chooses to try something a little softer, grapefruits. Even so, it doesn't work out that well. Kinsey is busy washing dishes and Nina is pouring herself another drink. So only Tyler sees his failure. What did the grapefruits do to you? He asks. I'm trying to juggle like dad used to. Nina gulps down her drink and reaches for a couple of the dishes Kinsey just finished drying. Tell you what, kid, I can do it like your father could. He could get four or five things in the air at once, but I do have a handle on the basic technique. It's like, while one is in the air, see? You pass it with your other hand. Nina's effort goes just about as well as Bodhi's and all three of the dishes she grabbed hit the kitchen floor and shatter to pieces. Shit! Well, at least they were the ugly dishes. Now that just bothers me. I know I can do this. Kinsey looks at the dishes she just finished cleaning and stares blankly at her mother. There wasn't anything good to eat, so... Tyler had been eating some leftover Chinese food for dinner. He's starting to lose his appetite. He sees his brother Bodhi's demeanor shift and places a hand on the boy's shoulder. It's like riding a bicycle. Once you got the trick in your muscle memory, you almost never... Nina's second trio of dishes shatter to pieces just like the first. Fuck! You know, Kinsey... Maybe if you dried these dishes before you put them on the rack. Bodhi approaches his mother and attempts to reason with her. Mom? Mom! It's alright. You can do it some other time. Can we go have story? 
Nina, lowers her head, hiding her face from her son. Not now, Bodhi. I have to clean up. Mama made a mess. Kinsey kneels down to her brother's eye level and offers to read him a story instead. Bodhi solemnly agrees and goes upstairs to get ready. Once he is out of earshot, Kinsey asks Nina, Mom, if something's wrong, your dad got shot in the face this summer and I have apparently forgotten how to juggle. That's what's wrong. Kinsey rolls her eyes and exits the room. Tyler also makes his way for the exit, telling his mother that he promised to go meet up with Zach to study until around 11. But he'll try to make it back early, if possible. Some time passes. Nina is still drinking, now from the bottle. Bodhi is fast asleep. And Kinsey is talking to Jackie on the phone about Zack, apparently. She comments to her friend about how she once caught Zack seeing her messaging on her phone and it was like he'd never seen a text before. Story goes, Zack's parents are super back-to-nature hippie types or something. Like, they'd give him seeds for Christmas and stuff. Tomato seeds, at that. Nina sips her wine as she stares at herself in the window. Everything gets fucked up and smashed. Plates, windows, stools, my goddamn leg, my goddamn life. So sick of all the broken shit in my life. Time to get rid of it. Nina makes her way back to the medicine cabinet she opened earlier that day. You can go first, you useless piece of shit cane. Fucking shatter on me at the first sign of an armed psychopath? What good are you? Should have thrown you out weeks ago. I don't care if you did belong to my great granddaddy. You could go into the trash with all the other... Uh... What the fuck? Nina is caught off guard as she swings open the medicine cabinet door and sees her once broken cane fully restored. Nina removes the cane, sits on the toilet, places the cane in her lap, and examines it. She honestly can't tell if she's dreaming or just drunk. So she takes another sip. Then. Her eyes drift to the broken stool in the corner. There's no way, she mumbles to herself, scooping up the pieces and cramming them into the cabinet. Damn thing doesn't even fit. Put this back together, you hocus pocus motherfucker. Nina uses the entirety of her weight to cram the door closed. And as she backs up, she notices something strange happens. The cabinet begins to change shape right before her eyes. All right, wait a minute. Did you, weren't you thinner a second ago? I didn't think I was that drunk. Well, goddamn. Nina gasps as she once again opens the door to the cabinet. The door, and the cabinet by extension, is now a small cube where it once stood larger than it was wide. And within it sits a fully repaired footstool. That's so handy, she thinks aloud before rushing back to the kitchen to retrieve the box of broken dishes. When she returns, the cabinet is back to its regular shape and size. She chuckles to herself under her breath. Oh, I get it now. That's part of it. You can change shape to fix whatever needs fixing. Nice. Nina pours the contents out of the box and into the cabinet before closing and locking the door. 
She sits her wine on top of the cabinet, leans her cane on the wall, and kneels over, making sure not to avert her eyes this time. Making sure not to avert her eyes. Making sure not to miss the magic as it unfolds right before her. And to her surprise, it works. Nina quickly sips the rest of her wine before grabbing the stool and the plates and giggling all the way into the kitchen. This is incredible. Anything she wants to fix, she can fix. There are so many things that have gone wrong lately and really, it doesn't even matter. Her cane, the stool, the dishes, all of them are proof that this life of hers isn't over. No matter how broken she is, the pieces can always be put back together. Nina's giggle slowly turns into a stifled chuckle, then into a fit of laughter. Who cares anymore? Things can be like they used to. She grabs a couple of dishes from the pile and begins tossing them one by one into the air. She's juggling, just like Rendell taught her. That big show off. And if he thinks he's so great for juggling five items, then so can she. Nina reaches for her empty wine bottle and glass and inserts them into the rotation. However, just like with Bodhi earlier that night, Nina's eagerness and effort doesn't get her far and each one of the dishes goes plummeting to the ground. The smile does not leave Nina's face. Go ahead and smash, you fuckers. I can fix you later. I can fix everything. Now, not only intoxicated by alcohol, but the rush from witnessing the magic of one of the keys, Nina returns to the bathroom. But not before deciding to retrieve another bottle from the wine cellar. So, what do we fix next? She asks herself as she attempts to deal with her new and more current problem of uncorking the bottle so she can retrieve the aged nectar. And that's when Nina realizes the one thing that really needs fixing. Rendell. Since the summer, the entirety of who he is has been burned down and stored within a blood-red urn. It once sat on the mantle above the fireplace, but more recently, it's made its permanent residence on Nina's nightstand. For the first time since she found her cane fully repaired earlier that night, Nina doubts the power of the key and the cabinet. She doubts herself, wondering if anything that has gone on that night really did take place. Come on already, change size. You changed to fit the stool and you changed to fit the dishes. Get bigger, do something. Nina closes her eyes and places her forehead on the door of the cabinet before letting out what could easily be misconstrued as a prayer. Please, don't lead me on and fuck with me this way. You fixed everything else. Now fix him. Slowly, she turns the key and opens the door, only to see that nothing has changed. Maybe you need more time, because... Because he's just ash now, and and there's so much more to fix. It's not like a broken can, or I should clean up. I smell. You do what you need to do to fix him, and I'll make pretty. Nina takes a couple more sips from her bottle of wine before jumping into the shower. She makes sure to take her time. She hums. She sings. Again. She giggles, and she prepares herself for her husband. Then, she puts on the black lingerie 
that she just couldn't bring herself to get rid of. It was Rendell's favorite. Even with the unsightly scar on her leg, she'd say she looks pretty damn good. Then, when she's good and ready, Nina leaves her bedroom and makes her way back to the cabinet. On the way back, she notices someone in the kitchen. Sorry I took so long. You're back! Tears begin building in her eyes. It's been so hard without you. I never thought I'd go through anything so hard. Oh God, Rendell. Oh God, turn around. I want to look in your face. Tyler, clearly uncomfortable with his mother grabbing him from behind, asks her, Could you? Could you let go of me? Please? Nina looks up around her husband's shoulder to see the face of her son, Tyler. What the fuck? She shrieks. Why aren't you Rendell? You're supposed to be Rendell. Tyler pushes his mother off him and Nina, instantly ashamed, covers herself. Don't look at me like that. Like I'm crazy. Like I'm pathetic. She grabs her great-grandfather's cane and stomps into the bathroom. God damn it, it didn't work. It should have worked. It should have fixed him. Like it fixed everything else. She slams the cane on top of the cabinet, shattering it just as badly as it was the first time. Didn't fucking work. Mom, stop. Tyler reaches his hand out to try to calm his mother. Should have fucking worked. Nina kneels over and removes the blood red urn. Will you stop it? What are you doing with that? Get away from me. Tyler tries to retrieve his father's ashes from his mother, but his interference only creates a struggle that causes the two of them to drop the urn altogether. Look at what you made me do. Nina marches back into the kitchen to grab her wine bottle. I'm sorry, mom. It's just your drunk. Kinsey finishes her brother's sentence. Go to bed, mom. I know how hard it's been for you, losing dad, but we lost him too. And nothing you've been through, even being raped, gives you the permission to treat people who love you like. Nina, with all her might, slaps her daughter across the face. Kinsey scowls back at her mother. If you ever hit me again, I'll walk out of this house and not come back. I'm not afraid to walk away from you forever. Go ahead. Do it. Find out if I mean it. No! A small voice cries out from behind Nina. She turns around and sees Bodhi. Just like her, tears are pouring down his face. His two hands clasped over his ears in a desperate attempt to block out the bad. Everybody, stop fighting! Bodhi! Nina goes to comfort her son, but Kinsey blocks her off. Don't. Just don't. I'll put him back in bed. Move out of my way, or... Or what? Don't you get it? You've got nothing to threaten me with. I'll take care of him. You're not up for it tonight. Or most nights. Kinsey lifts Bodhi up and exits out the room. Once again, it's just Tyler and Nina. She covers her face in shame. Say it, she tells him. I can't believe you'd use your hands on her. After the shit this family has been through. After Sam Lesser beat her unconscious. As for the rest of your shit, your moods, your drinking, I can take whatever you can dish out. So can Kinsey. But if you ever put Bodhi through the emotional ringer like that again, so help me. What? Nina snaps. So help you what, Tyler? 
I don't know. Christ. The women in this family are tough. I like to be half as tough. I'm just saying. Kinsey can't be his mother. Neither can I. That's right. He's stuck with me. Get used to it. And don't give me that pitying look. I don't want your pity. Not any of you. What do you want? I want you to grow the hell up and get the hell out. Instantly, Nina regrets her words and once again covers her face in shame. Can't wait, Tyler tells her. I wish I graduated tomorrow, but unfortunately, I have to wait seven more months before I can get the fuck out of this madhouse. Let's not have too many more scenes like this, okay? I'd like to not completely hate you by then. Nina spends the night sobbing, uncontrollably. She kept saying it, but she doubts her son could hear her apologize. She was all alone, and the only things that kept her company that night were the darkness and shadows themselves. The next morning, the children wake up to find the kitchen still in a mess and smelling like alcohol. With a shared sigh between them, they decide it's best to divvy up the tasks. Kinsey will sweep and mop, Bodhi will help with the dustpan and take out the trash, and Tyler will clean the bathroom. It takes less time for Bodhi and Kinsey to clean the kitchen than they expected. Their concern begins to grow, however, when they notice that something is holding up their brother. Kinsey pokes her head into the bathroom and sees her brother hunched over the broken pieces of the urn, petrified. Ty, how's it going? Need any help in here? Ty? Kinsey walks a little closer to examine what has her brother so captivated. And that's when she sees it. Within the dunes of her father's ashes, spilling out of the broken pieces of the urn, sits a jet black key with the head of it fashioned in the shape of the Omega symbol. They don't speak to each other, but the two share a mutual understanding that this is the beginning of the end.